Good evening, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. I want to talk about uh, clouds. So until roughly 2012, I took for granted what most media and governments, less so, uh, were saying about climate change. And then around that time, I started learning about self-reinforcing positive feedbacks and about the methane clathrite gun and realized that we uh, were not exactly being told the truth about things. And uh, further I've gone, um, um, the more I've realized that we're being told a pack of lies. Climate change is abrupt and it's now and it's far more than about gradual sea level rise that we're being told that it's all about. And then add to that, uh, last summer, I could not escape profound changes in our skies and have been very concerned about it ever since. I've had to uh, reconsider a lot of my previous held beliefs about things yet again. Basically, I was coming across testimony from people um, from all parts of the world, but I could ignore it completely until I uh, started to see with my own eyes. So, from a combination of what I was seeing in the sky above us and looking at satellite pictures on NASA World View, I began to realize that the picture is way more complicated than ever I had thought. And after doing some research, I realized that in addition to man-made climate change from greenhouse gases, there must be geoengineering occurring. So this uh, short video encapsulate uh, what I and uh, a friend uh, from further up uh, north uh, was 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 seeing over our over our summer. So just today, and we're headed for the uh, winter solstice, the skies have been very, very similar. Uh, it's warm, and temperatures during the middle of the night were 17 degrees Celsius. What it is now, or in the, or was in the in the early afternoon, and then dropped to uh, seven degrees. So just have a look at uh, the skies uh, just from today. In fact, you know we're just not getting any sun because whenever the uh, the sky is clear uh, this is what we get. So this is the uh, the sky today above our house. Um, 
yeah, all of this stuff. I don't know what type of cloud you would call it. Um, it uh, more or less blotted out the sun. Yesterday was completely overcast. We woke up with a clear sky and uh, this is what it became. And then um, just a few hours later, it turned into this. So is there any wonder why we uh, very rarely see the sun? There just seems to be no heat in the sun, even though the temperatures are, ambient temperatures are quite high, higher than normal, and why we never, ever, ever see any stars in the night sky. Here's my introduction to homogeneous cloud. A wee way back I posted an article with these strange cloud formations and explained that although I have seen these clouds on a regular basis in the last year, whereas previously I had never seen them before at any stage of my 63 years on the planet. So this was what uh, Margot and I saw over Nova Zemlia. Look at these, uh, these, these, these patterns. So a reader came back immediately uh, and hopefully, helpfully pointed me towards pictures of what I learned are called scalar wave clouds. So I decided to look back at previous years and I got hold of a copy of Collier's Encyclopedia from about 1980 and to see what it said about cloud formations. So uh, I think these are just the main, uh, what they call genus, the main types of, uh, of, of clouds. Um, and the closest to what we're talking about is this. Um, it's the alto cumulus cloud. But um, so these are the types of clouds that they talk about. So on searching, I found a video made by an Andy Leifer who leaps back over old books on clouds and finds examples from the 1920s and 1930s of alto stratus cloud, which Collier says uh, rain or snow will follow within 15 hours, 15 or 20 hours. Now the thing is that I've seen these uh, types of clouds several times and they've never once produced rain or snow when I have seen them. Um, so I went to Wikipedia to see uh, what they would say about it compared with Collier's. And um, so they talk about uh, all these different clouds, high form, cirro, cirriform, stratocumuliform, and stratiform. It's, it's in great detail. Um, and one of the interesting things that they talked about um, was a homogeneous cloud. They have come up with a new category of clouds that was definitely not in Collier's or any other form of books on clouds. And what they say is. Contrails formed from the exhaust of aircraft flying in the upper level of the troposphere can persist and spread into formations resembling any of the high cloud genus types and are now officially designated as cirrus, cirrostratus, or cirrocumulatus homogenitus. If a homogenitus cloud of one genus changes to another genus type, it is turned a homo mutatus cloud. Stratus caractogenitus, Latin for cataract made, are generated by the spray from waterfalls. Silver genitus is a stratus cloud that forms as a water vapor is added to the air from a forest canopy. Hmm. So the interesting thing about the Wikipedia articles, uh, and there are at least two of them, um, 
on clouds is that they have the following examples of clouds that would certainly never have ex featured in previous books on clouds, probably because they never existed. They're precisely those clouds that people have been posting on the internet to indicate their fears about geoengineering, chemtrails, and so forth. So it all seems to me a bit like an attempt to paint as normal something which is not normal at all. And skeptics tend to point to articles like this and say, look, here you are, it's in Wikipedia. It's all normal and scientific. It's all got Latin names, etc. What we're seeing, however, is nothing more or less than a classification of clouds using traditional criteria. Just classifying something and giving it a Latin name gives it a scientific aura and says nothing about the origin of the clouds. So here are some examples of what I'm talking about. So with all those Latin names, of course, it has to be right, yeah? So, uh, oh, look at this. Perfectly normal. High Cirrus Uncanus and Cirrus Vibratus. Uh, upper left merging into Cirrus Stratus Vibratus with some higher Cirrus Cumulus Flocus upper right. So what could be more normal than that? If you see that in the sky. Or this. So all of these are kind of the prime examples in Wikipedia of what clouds should look like. So reality has been rewritten as we, um, as we, well, it's been rewritten uh, before our very eyes. So there's this. Now that looks really uh, normal. Sunrise scene giving a shine to an alter cumulus stratiforus Pelosidius cloud, or, uh, and then there's this, high cirrus uncanus and cirrus vibratus. Uh, oh, I think we might have seen that before. Never mind, I put that twice. And then there's this, this normal, isn't it? Cirrus vibratus radiatus. So just because something as weird as the above is given a name like Cirrus Vibratus Radiatus, does it mean that it has a natural origin? Of course it doesn't. So here are some cloud formations that have been described as scalar energy clouds, and I haven't seen any examples really, apart from these weird ones above. Um, so there's this. Someone caught? And there's this. Now that looks as if it's been zapped with some sort of electromagnetic energy, or <laughs> maybe uh, um, maybe it's an example of terraforming by by aliens. I don't know. Uh, so here goes uh, an article. I'll just read this one article uh, that was written: Cirrus homogenitus. In the past, meteorologists refused to include human-made phenomena in their classification of cloud types. Yes, they said, the steam and smoke coming out of our smokestacks can appear like clouds or fog, but they're not really. While weather observers might observe reduced visibility and even attribute in part to our activities, there was no place for them on the reporting forms. If they were going to mention smog or condensation trails, it would be in the comments only. In the case of condensation trails, they became abbreviated in common language as contrails. On the reporting forms, they appeared in the comments section as cotra. Now, with the updating this year of the International Cloud Atlas, hosted by the World Meteorological Organization, as reported on the Greed Comet blog, a number of new cloud types have been included. I've gradually reported on Asperitas, Volutus, and Flumen, which are natural cloud types that have been included in this edition of the Atlas. Today I present another inclusion, this time a cloud type that results from human activity, Cirrus homogenitus. Literally, Cirrus made by humans. Condensation trails can now come out of the comments and take their rightful place on the form proper. 
Cirrus homogenitus is the new name for contrails that have persisted for at least 10 minutes. It comes in the one type only, with no subtypes or varieties. That's because contrails are usually quite ephemeral and either disappear or change rapidly, or they're transformed into something else. Cirrus homogenitus are like other cirrus clouds in that they don't result in any precipitation or other weather. Unlike cirrus, they can't even be credited with foretelling the approach of a weather system. They're just the result of an airplane flying in the stratosphere, pretending nothing more than its arrival, hopefully at its destination. So there's an article down here. Um, I'll provide a link uh, down below, but I'll leave it at that. So next I'd like to share this. Uh, this is an article from the 27th of June this year from uh, New Scientist. And the headline, it turns out planes are even worse for the climate than we thought. The contrails left by aeroplanes last only hours, but they are now so widespread that their warming effect is greater than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aeroplanes that has accumulated in the atmosphere since the first flight of the Wright brothers. Worse still, this non-CO2 warming effect is set to triple by 2050 according to a study by Ulrika Burkhardt and Lisa Bock of the Institute of Atmospheric Physics in Germany. Altogether, flying is responsible for around 5% of global warming, the team says, so this figure will soar even higher if no meaningful actions are being taken to present, prevent this. Lots of people talk about the need to stop air traffic increasing all the time, but this is not being taken that seriously, said Burkhardt. And the discussions that are taking place focus almost entirely on the associated CO2 emissions. That's a problem if the non-CO2 effects are larger than the CO2 ones, she says. The non-CO2 warming is the elephant in the room, says Bill Hemmings of Transport and Environment, a Belgium-based campaign group. All aircraft that burn fuels leave behind a trail of exhaust fumes and soot. At high altitudes, water vapour often condenses on the soot particles and freezes to form a cirrus cloud that can persist for seconds to hours depending on temperature and humidity. Clouds can have both a cooling and warming effect. They reflect some of the sun's rays back into space but also block some of the heat radiated by Earth's surface. On average, both thin natural cirrus clouds and contrails have a net warming effect. But of course there are unnatural cirrus clouds as well. Burkhardt and her colleagues used a computer model of the atmosphere to estimate how much warming contrails caused in 2006 the latest year for which detailed air traffic inf infantry is available and how much they will cause by 2050 when air traffic is expected to be four times higher. Hmm. The model accounts for not only uh, of the change in air traffic volume but also the location and altitude of flights along with the changing climate. The team concludes that the warming effect of contrails will rise from 50 milliwatts per square metre of Earth's surface in 2006 to 160 milliwatts per metre squared by 2050. In comparison, the warming due to CO2 from aviation will rise from 24 to 84 megawatts per square metre. So that's 160 compared with 84 by this time. 
in a scenario in which the airline industry increases fuel efficiency and reduces the number of soot particles emitted by improving fuels and engines, the warming from contrails by 2050 is limited to 140 megawatts per meter squared and the warming from CO2 to 60 megawatts per meter squared. But reducing contrail warming won't be easy. It's much easier, harder than CO2, which they also can't reduce in any way, says Burkhardt. And we aren't doing anything effective about that either. Just read, we aren't doing anything about it. We're increasing the number of flights, etc., etc. There's absolutely no doubt that aviation CO2 needs to be addressed properly. And there is absolutely no doubt that it is being addressed at all effectively. At all. An international scheme called Corsia is supposed to limit aviation emissions, but its plan is instead to offset emissions, an approach known to be ineffective. What's more, the airline industry is trying to use Corsia to block additional measures such as taxes on aviation fuel. And then there is the non-CO2 warming. The attitude has been that there are uncertainties, so let's just sit on our hands and do nothing, says Hemming. They are indeed large uncertainties whenever clouds are involved, says Burkhardt, but these go both ways. The study could be underestimating control warming by as much as 70%. And they're always going to finish with good news. The one bit of good news is that contrails become more common. They reduce natural cirrus cloud formation by using up all the water available. This cuts the overall warming effect attributable to contrails by a fifth. So that's why I see these uh, cirrus cloud, the unnatural form, uh, just about any time uh, the sun comes out and, uh, and the sun is blotted. Uh, I hardly ever see uh, a clear sky anymore. So in conclusion, I no longer believe in much of what we're being told by governments and media. Things are, as I said, way, way worse than we're being told. I don't believe the conclusions either of the chemtrail community or much of them. Much of it reeks uh, to me of climate change denial and it is uh, uh, it serves as a kind of distraction. Um, by the same token, I certainly don't believe the people that scoff and dismiss claims that are prob often are presented with some uh, evidence. Um, so I think things are very, very complicated and way, way worse than we're being told. Neither geoengineering, blotting out the sun, or any, any else mad scientist can come up with is going to save us. It's all in the lap of the gods. This is Seymour Rocks reporting from Dallas.